Okay, 7.6, the Millikan oil drop experiment. Now, this is the last uh, lesson for electric fields, and we're going to be going on to magnetic fields next. Now, the Millikan oil drop experiment is a famous experiment that uh, you're definitely going to hear about more if you study physics anymore. Um, and it was a way that the electron was first measured, the fundamental charge, the elementary charge of electrons and protons. And so it's a pretty cool idea. Um, the guy named Robert Millikan came up with it, and so we're we'll just we're going to talk about that in this lesson. And there's a bit of calculations. You'll see how how he actually did his calculations and how you could do the same sort of thing. So to start off with, there are certain fundamental physical cons constants out there, and these are measurable values that are constant. and can be found can be found experimentally well i didn't really leave myself enough room for that word experimentally um, let me just do that one more time here experimentally okay so these are our fundamental physical constants and when Millikan came around in 1909, he said, well, I think there is a fundamental physical constant that is the, called the elementary charge, the minimum possible charge that something can have. So this is, we'll say, Millikan believed in an elementary charge and we call it E, that was the smallest, or we'll say that is the smallest unit of charge. So he says, there's nothing in nature that has a smaller charge than E. This is going to be our fundamental elementary charge. And he said that that's what that's the charge that the electron has. And at this point, we knew that electrons existed, but we didn't know what their charge was. So he came up with an idea how he could measure that. So let's see, Millikan's experiment. He sprayed oil drops. He sprayed oil drops between two electric plates. using an atomizer using an atomizer and that's basically just think of your spray bottles that you might have at home uh, just a spray bottle which ionized the drops so when you use a spray bottle um, the the particles get a bit ionized because of the friction of um, of being turned into that sort of mist, and so some of them are positive, some are some of them are negative. Okay, then he then adjusted the voltage in the plates, adjusted the voltage in the plates so that the electrical force equaled the gravitational force because these oil drops were falling down but he changes the force here, the, the voltage so that the electric force upwards balances it which um, suspending a drop in the air And then he could use Fe to find Q, the charge on that um, on that that drop. 
So this was his idea, and I'm sorry that there's so much writing on this one, but it's really, we're talking about an experiment, an idea that somebody came up with. So this is what he, what he thought he could do. Now we're not quite done. Um, sorry, this one says Fe. Okay, we're not quite done here, because we get the charge of each drop, but sometimes that might have two extra electrons, or three, or five, who knows. So um, what he says is, if Q um, is always a multiple of some minimum, some minimum value, then that value is E. And he would be right. His theory would be right. So that's what he's going for. He's trying to find out if I have all these drops, are they all going to end up having multiples? Are their Qs all going to be a multiple of some some E value? And so he just did this over and over again, shot a bunch of little drops into here, adjusted his voltage so that they were just hovering in the air, and then found out what that voltage was. So his process here, we can say to find Q, this is what he did. He says, well, the electric force is equal to Q epsilon. We know that. That's one of our equations. When, when the particle is suspended, when it's just hovering in the air, it means that Fe is equal to Fg, which means that Q epsilon is equal to Mg, which means that Q is equal to mg over epsilon. This is when everything's balanced. And the last piece we can say is since epsilon is equal to delta v over delta d, then q is equal to, well, we still have our mg, and we replace epsilon with delta v over delta d. So that brings delta d onto the top, and delta V on the bottom. And I'm going to say delta V B, where delta V B is the potential difference the potential difference when the drop is balanced. And so this is the voltage that he's controlling to get it to hover in the air. So he has um, G and delta D, that's uh, the distance between the plates, and delta VB. He has all this information. The last thing that he doesn't necessarily have is the mass of the drop. And to get that, um, he got, he got M by dropping the drop, by releasing the drop. So he removes his electric field, just lets it, lets it fall straight down, measuring the final speed, measuring VF. and then finding, using that information and the time and everything to get the acceleration to get to get the Fg and F air, the air resistance. And using that he is able to find the mass. So this is what he did. So he, he kept on repeating this experiment. He would hover it, write down the voltage he got, drop it, and use the information to get the mass so that you could do this whole equation. And what he found was indeed his hypothesis was correct and they all had a, they were all multiples of some fundamental charge. And so in here I've actually I've written electric charge I meant to write elementary charge. Elementary. 
So the elementary charge is E is equal to 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And we've used that a few times already. That is what he found using his oil drop experiment. Nobody had found that before. And one thing I'll say is that he got this positive value. And of course, for the positive value, it's actually a proton. What's happening is he was measuring um, the value for drops that had been ionized in a positive way. The electrons had been stripped. It doesn't really matter, but anyway, he got, a, he got the positive value, and that's the value for a proton. OK, and um, using this information, we can figure out how many excess protons there are on something. So in his, his experiment, maybe he had three excess protons, because three el electrons have been removed, that sort of thing. We can find out the charge, Q, from excess protons. Q is equal to NE. Um, when an object has n protons, uh, n more protons, when an object has n more protons than electrons. So if we have n, we have four extra protons, then we can get our, our charge from the number of, uh, number of protons times E. So we're going to do that. Calculate the charge on a small sphere with an excess of 3.2 times 10 to the 14 electrons. Okay, well we have Q is equal to NE, and our N is 3.2 times 10 to the 14, and E, well we need to be careful here. We use the letter E for positive and negative. In this case we're dealing with electrons, so we've got negative 1.602, times 10 to the negative 19. And here we go. We get negative 5.1 times 10 to the 5 coulombs. Good. If you turn to the next page, we're going to do a bit of the, the math ourselves in a Millikan-type experiment. We have two horizontal plates are maintained. There's supposed to be an M there. Maintained at a potential difference of 360 volts are separated by 2.5 centimeters. A latex sphere with a mass of 1.41 times 10 to the negative 15 kilograms hangs between the plates, the upper plate of which is positive. The first question is, is the sphere negatively or positively charged? Well, I'm just going to quickly draw our picture here. We've got um, a positive plate, we've got a negative plate, and then we've got our sphere here. And we can say this is 2.5 centimeters, 2.5 cm. That's our separation. OK, and so we've got our sphere. So the question is, is the sphere negatively or positively charged? We've got it balanced there. It's hanging between the plates. That means that Fg is equal to Fe. OK. Now, gravity is acting downwards. Fe has to be acting upwards. Now think, normally our epsilon our epsilon goes from positive to negative. So if our force, if our electrical force is acting upwards, opposite the, uh, the epsilon, then that means that we must have a negative sphere. So we can say epsilon points down, and Fe points up, Therefore, Q is negative. All right, so that's part A. Part B, we want to calculate the magnitude of the charge on the latex sphere. Well, I'm going to use the equation from the previous page. This guy here, we did this whole derivation, and we got this value. Q is mg delta d over delta vb. This is what I'm going to use here. So this is when everything's balanced. Q is equal to mg delta d over delta vb. And we can put in our numbers. 1.41 times 10 to the negative 15 times 9.8 times 2.5 times 10 to the negative 2. Divide all of that by 360 volts, and we get 
9.596 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Last piece, determine the number of excess or, or deficit, let's say or deficit particles on the sphere. All right, well, we have Q is equal to NE, which means that N is equal to Q over E, which is equal to 9.596 times 10 to the negative 19 over E, 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19. And this gives us a value of 6 excess protons. Oh, sorry, not protons. 6 excess electrons, because we're dealing with, um, with a negative Q. So in fact, I, I probably should have in here a negative Q. Um, so our equation up here, this Q is mg delta v, all, all this, it gives us a positive value, but really we need to use our, our knowledge that it needs to be negative to put that in there. So the equation just gives the, the uh, magnitude. It doesn't tell us the direction. So I've popped in the negative there, pop in the negative here, um, and negative for our electrons. So here we get six electrons. Good. All right. Finally, last little piece of information here. So we said E is fundamental. There's nothing smaller than it. You can't have a charge smaller than 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19. That is the smallest amount of charge that you can possibly have. That's what we've said. Well, not actually true. There are what's called quarks, and in fact, they are what make up a lot of our particles. Protons and neutrons are, are made up of quarks. Each of them are made up of three different quarks. An electron is not. The electron is, is a bit different, but our quarks are also fundamental particles. Which means that, in fact, um, protons and neutrons are not fundamental. They're made up of quarks. But electrons are fundamental. So we have fundamental particles here with charge of one-third E or two-thirds E. So in fact, quarks do have a smaller charge than E. One-third E or two-thirds E. But the funny thing is, you know, there's never, you never have a quark all on its own. You have particles that are going to be made up of three different quarks, that sort of thing. Um, and so what we have is that in the subatomic particles that are made up of quarks, they all have a whole number multiple of E. Multiple of E for charge. Even though they're made up of quarks. So that's kind of interesting. And I don't think we have a good reason for that yet. Just seems to be some law in physics that, the, that it's deciding that it needs to add up that way. Um, there is speculation that there is a thing called conservation of charge. So like we have conservation of mass energy and we have conservation of you know, all these things, charge is also conserved where we say that in the universe there is a total amount of charge out there and we can't create it or destroy it. Um, now, I don't know if that's been confirmed, but that's one of the ideas out there as well. So that's the end of this chapter, and you've got a few homework problems there. And next up, we're going to have magnetism.